Hello, friends. It's Julie. I wanted to let you know that the Angel School is back. For those of you who don't know, my Angel School program does two things for you. First, it certifies you as a Reiki master teacher. That's right. You are going to become a Reiki master teacher which means that you'll learn how to feel energy, how to feel into the chakras, how to understand the pain that's there and remove that and clear that from people's chakras, from their auric field. Not only can you do this for others, but it's going to teach you how to do it for yourself. Also, with the Angel School, you learn how to connect with your angels, your guides, and your loved ones on the other side. You learn how to bring through your messages for you and for other people. Some people love to take the Angel School because they want this information for themselves. They want to be able to connect more deeply with their intuition and really feel aligned all the time. Other people feel called to do this work as a job or profession. And if that's you, that's fantastic. Let's get you certified so that you can be working on other people, on clients as a Reiki master teacher and as a certified angel messenger. For details on all of this, go over to my website, jancis.com or email me and we will get you all registered. You're listening to Angels and Awakening, where we believe daily life can be lived from a constant state of love, joy, peace, bliss, ease, and grace. Why are people always searching for a better way to live? Because there is one. Life doesn't have to be stress-filled and anxiety-ridden. You can make lasting changes that lead to a life you love. My name's Julie Jancis. I have the gift of connecting with angels and bringing through their healing, positive messages to my clients every day. Join us on the Angels and Awakening podcast each week as we explore big spiritual questions, interview experts, and bring through angel messages. I'm so excited you're here. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host, Julie Jancis. And today I have on a special guest. Her name is Lauren Buckley. And Lauren, I think you've known me since I was in diapers. True? I have. Do you know what's funny, Julie? I was just thinking today. I can remember as if it were yesterday, the very moment I saw you. No. And there you are with your little blonde hair. You were wearing a yellow dress and you were going to be the flower girl at um, Mark and Teresa's wedding. Oh my gosh. Was that the flower girl dress? That big poofy one? Yeah. Oh, I so remember that dress. That was an amazing wedding. Wasn't it? Yeah. I still remember my dress too. (laughs) Yikes. That's not, not, that was not one of the ones that you can wear over again. Yeah. Okay. I gotcha. Um, (laughs) So Lauren and I have known each other all my life and Lauren is one of the most spiritual people I have met. And there are people who have kind of come into spirituality more over the last five to 10 years. But I wanted to have a conversation with Lauren for the podcast because she just has such a wealth of knowledge. I mean, you were following Sylvia Brown back in the day. You've studied this your whole life and and you have so much great insight. So I thought that we would just have a have a conversation. I think that sounds wonderful. And thank you for all of that. My goodness, too much credit. Oh, <laughs> no. Credit where credit is due. Um, one of the other things about Lauren, and here's where I kind of want to start and where I'm being led by spirit today, is you've had a lot of people pass in your life, people that you were the closest to here. And we talked earlier about loss, and I think it would be so valuable for the audience to understand how you've been able to cope with that loss 
there are so many clients that I have, Lauren, who come to me and you can tell in their energy, they're either going to go one of two ways. There's only two ways to go. You can shut down and really drag your heels and kind of put your roots in where you're not going to move. And the energy for that is just so real in, in some folks. There's other people, though, who have major losses, and it's not that they're not sad about it. They are completely devastated, but they find that courage within them to go on. And I can't even fathom some of the losses that you've been through, so I'm not even going to try. But for so many of my listeners out there who are at this juncture in their life, and we're all going to be one day, how were you able to do all of that? Well, it's kind of funny. I'm just looking at a quote that I have been keeping on my desk for I don't know how long. And it says, you never know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice you have. That that was part of it. But um, (laughs) interestingly, one of the one of the reasons that I started really an in-depth study, in addition to, you know, just being raised with a very, very spiritual mother and just an old Irish belief system in angels and, and guardians and things like that. In addition to that, um, my husband and I lost a dog. You remember Buckley? Yeah. And I was absolutely inconsolably devastated by it. And so I started reading and researching and uh, wishing that I was getting credit for a PhD in, in the afterlife and just in spirituality and things like that. And I remember my husband would come home and, and look at me reading a book, yet another book. As you said, Sylvia Brown, John Edward, James Van Prague, uh, Patrick Matthews, and now I have you in my life. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> I, I just studied it consistently, looking for signs and and looking for things. And very, very sadly, six years after this start of this journey, um, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And even though we uh, we really fought. He was he was the poster boy for we're going to cure this. Uh, it was discovered at stage four, and the diagnosis was never good. But we never knew that, nor did we ever believe it. So, 22 months after that time, um, my husband Dennis passed, and it became the ultimate test of strength and stamina and really the test of walking the walk of the talk that you've talked. And I feel that that whole study, the whole really headlong jump into the spiritual world was to allow me to get through losing him. So that was, that was the start of it. And um, as he was passing, I, I crawled up in bed with him because it was laboring and you could tell he was he was on his journey and I promised him promised with all of my heart that I would be okay and that it was all right for him to go so in addition to walking through what I had believed I my faith is so strong that I honestly believe that um, those that we have lost actually can see how we're doing and they're checking it. And I made a promise and I was going to keep that promise. And that's how I got through every day. And I'm not saying that there weren't days that were seemingly impossible, but every time I would think, oh, I can't do this, I would um, experience every morning I'd take my my other dog out and take a walk. And if I was going to take a walk in the neighborhood, you better believe I was going to have makeup on. And if I was going to have makeup on, I might as well have taken a shower. 
So that's how my day routine started and continued. Hmm. So it's just a matter of, wow, you don't know how strong you are until you don't have a choice. Yeah. Because when something like that comes up, a crisis like that, there really isn't any time to prepare. You're just thrust into it. You know, you are. And and even though we had 22 months, we didn't believe it, you know. And, and on that last final, at that final day, I didn't know it was going to happen that day. Um, I believe that, that that's a contract that, uh, that he made with God. And I, I often wonder, why did you choose August 7th? You know, how odd, how random was that? But that's, that's not for me to know. Um, but I think that the important thing to remember is that every single day we have with somebody is precious. Mm-hmm. Every single moment. And that's not to say that, you know, we can't get irritated or annoyed with people or, you know, have a sigh and think, oh, no, not this again. But the fact is, you just make the most. And fortunately, in, in our entire marriage, um, we shared everything. You know, we, it wasn't at the end a big soulful, oh, I need to tell you this. I mean, we told each other how we felt, how much we loved each other um, every single day, every minute. And that's a, another important thing. Tell people how you feel about them when they're here. Now, I'm not saying that they won't hear you after they're gone. It's just better to get a reaction from them. And then they can have the opportunity to say it back to you. Yeah. There are so many clients that I have come in. And one of the things that almost kind of crushes my heart is when a family member on the other side brings through a message of, I just need them to know that I love them so much. And that sounds like the most vague thing. But when that comes out, a lot of times people will say, my father never told me he loved me or my mom wasn't affectionate or she didn't share that. And so to hear it from the other side is so valuable, but I love what you're saying is say it here. Uh, We've worked through a lot of this generationally, right? Of our parents' generation or their parents' generation weren't able to say the types of things though that way that we're able to say it now. Um, But there are some people still here on earth today that are working through that energy. And I love the message to just start now. You know, in, in our family, we would never get off the telephone without saying, I love you. And then the response to that was, I love you more. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my nieces and nephews were little and I would say, you know, I love you. I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. You know, it's like, <laughs> like when you're in junior high. No, you hang up. No, you hang up first. And I remember once my my youngest niece said to me, "No, Lauren, I love you the most. I love you seven zero eight two four six one two seven one, which was her phone number." And I thought, well, that's the most giant number she knows. Okay, she just turned thirty, and I still remember that. You know, those are things that you don't forget. And when, you know, when we, when people become um, a memory, that's what we have to hold on to. And uh, I, I also think that it's really, really important. The, the best thing that anybody can talk to me about is the kind of person that he was. And share a great memory, especially a funny one. Mm-hmm. You know, it it just it keeps people alive in our hearts and in our spirits and in our lives. And um, having lost my mother then three years ago, uh, I find that the same kind of comfort. Now, the way I I get through that because my mother died suddenly. I mean like sitting in a chair Mm -hmm. and, um, and she was gone. Now, how, what a blessing for her. Mm -hmm. What an absolute Mm -hmm. blessing that, that she was able. And I always wonder, you know, who came to get her that (laughs) enticed her enough to 
go to heaven with them and leave us here because that's not that's kind of unlike my mother. She would be more like, oh, no, I have to make sure that everything is in place. But um, but the beautiful thing is now I hear so many of my conversations. I hear my mother speaking through me and I know she's speaking through my heart. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful way to keep her alive. And my mother was a very, very, very funny lady. So I get a lot of credit. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. So you hear um, her speak to you in different situations and then you kind of say what she's saying? Absolutely. That's and hysterical. and I give her, I do give her credit. I, I <laughs> you know, especially when I'm talking to her grandchildren and her great grandchildren, I'll say, you know, oh, your grandma or your great grandma used to say, and then whatever <laughs> unbelievable words of wisdom that have come from my mouth that yeah. are actually from her mouth. Yeah. So that's what I mean. I get a lot of credit for being so smart. That is so, that's so wonderful. I love that. Um, <laughs> going back to one of the things that you said, it's really hard for some people to acknowledge, like when Dennis was sick, did you have some friends who kind of shied away from it because they didn't know what to say? Because you've been through this so much, how do you approach people when they are sick or when they've lost somebody? How do you say, hey, I was just thinking of this person and this memory? What's the correct way to go about that? Um, there, any way is correct. Any reference to somebody who, who you have a memory of uh, is it's all correct. It's all appreciated. It's it's amazing. Um, the the man that was Dennis's boss. He is one of the best people in the world for picking up the phone still. And it's 15 years this August, and he will still pick up the phone and say, "Hey, you know, I was just thinking about something that Dennis used to say," or um, most most clearly every year at the Chicago auto show, the blood drive is in, in Dennis's name because he was instrumental in bringing that blood unit onto the floor of the auto show. So it's always big accolades and, and it's a, it's, it's his legacy. And so I have so many of the people that worked at the auto show and, and work with Dennis that will meet me and donate blood with me. You know, and the whole time we're talking about Dennis and the beautiful thing is when people, as I said, when they can laugh and share a memory that made such a difference to them. It's, yeah. it's a, there is no wrong way to share a memory. I do not believe. Hmm. I love that. I love that. You have other, some angel stories that we want to talk about today. And so I wanted to have you tell um, the angel stories that you have. Well, I, and you know, when I said that I studied, uh, I started this study when we lost our dog, uh, that's in, that's on top of, of all of this, all of the, you know, the way that I was raised. Yeah. For example, um, my mother's mother from Ireland, my grandma Katie, uh, died exactly two weeks before I was born. And um, my mother, when she was concerned, worried, uh, or it was just necessary, would iron. <laughs> and she always told me that she was ironing. And uh, my dad was taking care of, of his mother-in-law. He was a med student and he was giving her some pain medication. And she said at one point, she just looked up at the clock and she noted the time and she just felt my mother just died. Mm -hmm. And five minutes later, my dad called and said, you know, your mother died five minutes ago. Wow. And she knew it. She knew it. She felt that just passing through her. And, um, Apparently, I was a colicky baby. I find it so hard to imagine that at any point in my life I caused anybody difficulty. <laughs> but um, 
my mother always talked about, you know, I wore you like a corsage for your entire infancy. She said, because it was so much easier to hold you and cook and do ironing again with the ironing. And <laughs> so my mother and I were um, very, 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 very close. And so many of my angel stories revolve around her and her um, missing her mother and, but, but celebrating, celebrating her mother. Mm -hmm. And one of the occasions was um, at my brother, my older brother is an ordained priest and at his ordination, which is an extremely solemn ceremony, if you've ever been through it. And, um, we were in the church and I was sitting next to my mother and she was like holding on to my arm and she said to me, do you see that? And she was looking at the altar and I said, no, what? And she said, uh, Grandma Katie is right up there with your brother. Hmm. And of course, I was maybe 20, oh no, I was probably 18, 19. And of of course, at that point, that was not cool to hear, and I was like, mm -hmm, "Okay, mom, yeah. we'll have to we'll have to have that checked for you." <laughs> but she said, "I'm it's she's right there," and so as I started to mature and really see how comforting my mother's spirituality was to her, and how huge a part of of her life that it was for every occasion. For every holiday, every celebration, um, those that had passed and and were watching us from heaven were always a part of what our traditions were and always included. And maybe not so far as setting a place for them at the table, although many, many people do that, but certainly lighting candles and always acknowledging those that have gone before us. And as our family started becoming bigger and bigger, um, then that would extend to the families of those who joined our unit as well. And it, and it really, you know, Julie, some, I know that I think what you said was so true a little while ago about um, our generation. Oh, oh, I wish I was part of your generation, but this generation is becoming more and more open about talking about feelings and expressing how you feel. And, you know, uh, when you're, when you're first engaging in the dating world, Oh my God, what's the biggest fear? I'm going to tell him I love him before he says it to me, you know, like <laughs> it's a, a sentence of some kind. Like if that happens, if I would say, I love you to somebody before they said it to me, you kind of wonder, well, then what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Whoever says it, yeah. <laughs> someone's got to say it first. Yeah. Why don't we just write it down and exchange it? <laughs> or better yet, let's text each other, sitting next to each other on a couch in the same room. I love you. And see if you get the same text back. I don't know what the answer is. All I know is that <laughs> when you speak it, it becomes powerful and mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. and really, really appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Let's, um, let's talk about Dennis. Okay. You and I have cool stories regarding numbers and knowing that things would happen at certain times in our life. And, um, can you tell us the story of how you met Dennis and how spiritually divine timing <laughs> it was, that was. It, I'm this is my favorite story because it's not even slightly exaggerated I'm not not the the rest of them weren't exaggerated either by the way but this one <laughs> in particular um from the time I was 25 to 30, oh, one of the most important things I needed to do, by the way, was move downtown because I thought um, living in Lincoln Park had to be the absolute thing to do. 
and I was not working in my field of study. I was working at a bank and I was living downtown and I was dating a guy that was really um, in probably every sense of the word, a bad choice. Just, you know, kind of had a little issue with the truth and a little issue with loyalty and things like that. Anyway, but I stuck stuck with it for like five years. And throughout that period of time, I would say kind of just to the universe, although I, I know I prayed um, and probably prayed very, very hard, but my, my prayer was, if he doesn't do something by the time I'm 30, and then I never finished, he better do something by the time I'm 30, or there was the end of my, my commitment to that thought. On the day after my 30th birthday, I was in St. Louis at a trade show, and this very, very bad choice of a human introduced me to Dennis. <laughs> they, had, they were kind of distant associates. We were at a cocktail party after the trade show, and it was very informal. You know, eh, Dennis, this is Lauren. Lauren, this is Dennis. And, and it was Dennis lightning. and I want. It was lightning. De uh, Dennis and I wound up um, visiting, you know, getting to know each other throughout the entire evening. And I had such a comforting thought. Oh, now this is the kind of man I could spend my life with. Mm. And I used to always ask my mom when I was little, mom, how will you know? How will you know when you've met the one? And she used to say, you know, so profoundly, you'll know. And it was <laughs> like at that cocktail party, I knew. However, didn't seem like that was really what was going to happen because he had a girlfriend. I had this awful boyfriend. And so I thought maybe what this Maybe what I'm hearing from my soul is this is the type of man you're going to marry. Yeah. And then, interestingly enough, um, Dennis and I continued to see each other, and I proposed a, a business lunch, which was entirely concocted because my company really <laughs> didn't have the right kind of business for his company, but it didn't really seem to matter. It just made sense that we got together and that business lunch lasted hours and hours. And we were together from that day forward. And what I love about this story is that you knew in your 20s because you heard it that um, you were only giving him until you were thir you turned 30 years old. And the day right. after, literally the day after you turned 30 years old, you meet October Dennis. 13th in St. Louis. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, and what's fascinating is with all my sessions, you know, when you work with so many people, you start to see similar threads come out between people and spirit sh shows you where there's commonalities. And what spirit will say is that we're so in a rush. We're in a rush to have a yes or a no answer. And in this situation with the gentleman that you were with for five years, that wasn't right. You could have tried to force that yes or that no, but you just knew that you were where you were supposed to be at the time and you had a timeline on how long you were going to give it. What spirit says is that most of the times we have like a, a puzzle piece in front of us, right? And we're trying to get to mm -hmm. the yes or the no, but it's just timing. The puzzle piece is timing. We don't have all the puzzle pieces yet. And is it true if you would have left this gentleman, you might not have met Dennis because he wouldn't have introduced you to him? But there was no way I could have met him without being it being through Ken. And uh, I love the I love the analogy of a puzzle piece. And you could also call each piece of that puzzle a mosaic. Mm. And I have often, often in my life reflected back on the fact that, oh, you know what? If that wouldn't have happened, this wouldn't have happened. And as you start putting the pieces together, 
not only does it start to complete a puzzle, it forms a really beautiful mosaic. Mm, It forms the picture of your life. Exactly. Exactly. And when the light shines on that mosaic, it sparkles. And sometimes when you're not looking at it through light, what you're focusing on is the cracks. Mm. And the moment you shift your energy and shift the focus, shift there's your thoughts. Where the light from. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's so true. You got to step back and look at the full picture and not up close. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I used to be in the hotel industry and I used to have uh, sales managers that worked for me. And I did a lot of sales training and I was, you know, very rah, rah, motivational and stuff like that. And um, when they would get really, really discouraged, I would just take them by the shoulders and I would just turn them around 360 degrees. And I said, all you're focusing on the other way is how far you have to go, how high that mountain is. Now look at it this way. Look how far you've come. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes we just have to take that breath. And um, and sometimes the breath comes in the form of a really beautiful memory. And it's, I'm not saying that it's not sad, Julie, to not have these people in your life. Mm-hmm. It is sad. Yeah. And it's difficult. But, you know, when, again, you know, my challenge was knowing that they're watching down. I made a promise, you know, I've got to keep that. And sometimes I have to take a step back and go, wow, I can't believe I got through this. I can't believe I actually am talking about this right now. And and there have been moments when I've thought, um, when you talk about grief, And you realize that uh, grief is something that you can't go over and you can't go under and you can't go around it. You have to go right through it. And sometimes the steps are very, very trudging. And sometimes when you get to, you you never really get to the other side, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not bad news. That's just here. You never get to the other side here through the grief. Right. Because the grief goes on for forever. It does. It doesn't. Uh, That the horrible pain and the tears don't. But uh, again, that's a process. And, and when I realize that in the 15 years that I've, I've done the work on living this, um, it stinks to be good at grief, <laughs> but yeah. you have to be good at something. Might as well be that. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. so many people try to hide it or they try to disguise it or they try to avoid it. And the point is, you can't. Right. Every mm-hmm. single one of us is going to lose someone we love very much. Yeah. And... Um, you don't have to dwell on it and you don't want to dwell on it. But that's why I say it, it makes it such a special practice to say, well, by the way, I love you Mm -hmm. or whatever form saying I love you is. My mother used to tell me, I love you many, many times a day. But one of the things she used to say to me is call me when you get home. So I know you're safe. Mm -hmm. and I miss hearing that and now my sister-in-law every time I see she and my brother first thing she says as I'm leaving call me when you get home Um, my older brother that's the priest used to call my mother after his church service on Sundays and it was their tradition for 35 years Mm -hmm. and now he calls me yeah that's how we work it. That's how you work it. 
So what spirit shows me is that grief comes in waves, right? We're not going to feel it all the time, but when it comes, you just lean into the wave, you feel the feelings and you, you ride the wave. You not only ride it, here's another little hint. And I absolutely received a huge honor last week. Um, a friend of ours who has lost their mother very recently was really having a difficult day. And I got a text, uh, hey, how are you? And I thought, well, that's nice to hear from her. I'm good. How are you? And she said, I'm having a struggle. It's this, I'm having a bad day. And she was cleaning out some things uh, that were her mom's. And I said, well, call me right now. I can't. I'm crying too hard. And I said, get a Kleenex, take a deep breath, and let's talk. And when you reach out to somebody when you're grieving, I promise you, you'll find a hand that will hold yours. There is someone there in your life that's been through it. And even if it's just to listen, and it was a beautiful conversation and it was met with oh my goodness such a thank you thank you thank you and I was the one that in the end was like thank you for Mm -hmm. honoring me to share this with yeah so look for somebody that uh, let's let's put it two ways look for somebody when you need comfort and look for someone who needs comfort Mm. when you're okay yeah Yeah, that's so true. Lauren, you are someone who actually feels spirit's presence and I can feel their presence, but I, my gifts are more hearing and seeing them physically. Um, excuse me. I'm wondering if you get these feelings too about the people who are around you that they just need that phone call or you get feelings that mom's around or Dennis is around. Um, because that isn't my first and foremost um, way of hearing and receiving communication from spirit. I'm wondering if you could tell us about that and what that feels like to you. Sure. It, um, you know how, when you get goosebumps on your arms, mm-hmm. well, that's a huge sign for me. And, you know, like if I'll be talking to somebody and all of a sudden, again, sometimes something my mother would have said comes out. I've got goosebumps right now. I've had goosebumps this whole conversation. That means I know that um, my mother and Dennis are sitting right here with me, mm-hmm. with Buckley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and probably your dad, Julie, yeah. because he would be part of this whole family of our communicating. Mm-hmm. And I have the chills. And it's not chills. It's goosebumps. It's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. a really neat sensa- sensation. And when, um, so during conversations or when I'm with somebody and I just feel that, uh, one time that I, I always feel it always is around my mother's great grandchildren and her children. Mm. And three of those babies were born right after my mom died. I mean, like a couple of days. And somehow I got the message, somebody told me or I read it, that when you've had a loved one that is recently passed and somebody is expecting a baby, that loved one will hold their souls in mm-hmm. heaven um, yes. until they're ready to come and be born. So not that all of those children are not so special and watched over by my mom, but every single time I'm in their presence and each one of them will look me so deeply in my eyes, I get that chill. Yeah. I definitely get that chill. Another sensation that I get often, often, all the time 
is I feel like somebody's playing with my hair. Really? And I, per- I particularly get this in the car. And it's, it's like the, the, just the top of my head, but toward the back. And um, I'll feel like a little sensation. And I will actually say, okay, who's here? <laughs> You're more than welcome to be here. And in the meantime, uh, do I need to check my hair? I mean, like, you know, that really was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you when, um, after Dennis died, and uh, it just took me a long time, a very, very long time to actually uh, get rid of his clothes, donate his clothes. I didn't get rid of anything. You know, I gave ties away and, and, kept some shoes because, you know, that would be very important to have shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He came back and didn't have shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I was moving. I, I, I was really having to move from what had been our home for 20 years to the day, by the way. Uh, another number thing. Yeah. Um, and I donated his underwear to a place in Downers Grove called Sharing Connections. So if any of the people that are listening want to donate some clothes or or furniture and things like that to that organization, it's great because it's uh, people don't pay for things. And this goes to people who need it, who are starting over, who maybe were a victim of a a fire or a flood or whatever. Anyway, I was driving down the street after having donated them. Now, I, you know, dropped this bag of things off. They graciously took it or threw it in a tub or whatever they did with it. And of course, I stood there and cried like a seven-year-old. And I'm tears are coming down my, my cheeks as I'm driving down the street in Downers Grove. And all of a sudden, I felt a thump on the back of my head. I mean, like the back of somebody's hand thump on the back of my head. And I stopped. It was startling. I was driving and I realized, oh, that was Dennis saying it's about time. (laughs) I knew what the message was as soon as I got it. I knew who it was from. And it's like, okay, got it. Yeah. Well, that's just, I love that. You're such an amazing person, Lauren. I just, I learned so much uh, from you throughout the years. You have always been such a special person. You know, I was thinking today, um, have you ever had the experience, and this is fascinating to me, where you remember a specific day of your childhood and you wonder, why did I remember, why am I remembering that day? Yeah. And um, you can, many times I can at least, I can remember what I was wearing you know, in the case of meeting you, yeah. I remember what you were wearing. Mm-hmm. And oh my goodness, to all of Julie's listeners, she was the most precious flower girl ever. <laughs> ever. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> and, um, but I wonder what are those days? Why those specific days? And it's not, I'm not talking about Christmases or other holidays. I'm talking about just random days. Well, what's now, interesting is I don't I don't know if we've talked about this, but something that spirit shows me a lot is what I call sliding time. So you can slide time back to the past, like you're talking about, like these memories just flicker up in into your, you know, you're just, you're not thinking about them and all of a sudden they're just there. Um, You can also slide time into the future. And when you're sliding into the past, if it connects with somebody on the other side, a lot of times that's a symbol for them knocking at your door, trying to get your attention. Because what spirit shows me is that they miss our energy being fully and completely with them too. They want to be able to connect with us. So connecting with spirit on the other side is like there being a doorway and one party's on one side and you're on the other. And there's ways and tools that we can both use from either side to get one another's attention. 
Ah, uh, they have my full attention. Apparently yeah. not, because otherwise, <laughs> you know, otherwise I'd be having random conversations to myself, and somebody would take me to the hospital. But um, that's very no. interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, there's actually one time that I remember specifically knowing and feeling this presence with me, comforting me. We were driving near my grandparents' old home in um, Arlington Heights, and my parents had just gotten divorced. And there was just a lot of negativity and chaos of everything that was just unfolding. And I remember looking out the window and feeling this total angelic presence, this uh, Reiki energy, with, but I didn't know it was Reiki back then. Um, sure. And I go to that time in my life a lot. And I go to that instance where I'm just in the car driving, listening to a conversation and feeling this heavenly presence. And I Reiki myself. So I'm going back and sending myself the energy that I needed to get through that time back then. That so is really powerful. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is a wonderful practice. Yeah. Yeah. And we can do that for other people too. Um, provide that Reiki energy to everybody that's there. Absolutely. I, I send, I send my mom and Dennis and, you know, all of the people that I think about, I send them Reiki energy all the time. Yeah. So I got to tell you, cause it ties in with your number story all my life in my twenties. I knew that I had deep purpose here. I knew I was supposed to do something. I just didn't know what it was at all. Um, so throughout my 20s, I would pray, God, you know, use me as a tool or what am I supposed to be doing? What is my purpose? What do you want me to do right now? And I would always hear the same answer to every question. Um, you're just supposed to live. You're just supposed to experience your life right now. You'll know when you're 33 what your purpose is. And I heard this for years and years and years. So I was really excited to get to my 33rd year. Uh, but that was the year that my dad passed. I was 33 when he passed. And I just didn't know that that was how it was all going to come through. And it was through him, correct? Completely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Numbers are so powerful. For some reason, as all through growing up, my favorite number was 23. And I never that never made any sense to me. And I have a very, very dear friend, David, and he has been a teacher for all of his career and a math teacher. And every time he needs to use an example, he says, and as my best friend, Lauren would say, we're using number 23. And I thought that's so random. And for some reason in the past five years, since, since I've been doing Reiki, as a matter of fact, uh, the number 43 comes up for me. Mm. And I'll look at the, at the clock and it'll be like, Oh, by the way, Julie, it's 2.33. I know. <laughs> I just looked at the clock. Um, what does 43 mean to you? Because I'll tell you what I've learned that it means. Um, well, I actually looked it up because there's that site that you can look up these numbers. Yeah, it's a, for anybody listening who wants to look at it, it's Joanne Sacred Scribes Number right. Index. So if you go to Google, you can Google it and look up any number. She's got all of the numbers in there and see what the meaning is. Um, okay, continue. So I looked up 43, and I carry it with me all the time. And what it means is ascended masters and angels are all around helping with their calming presence, helping to find your peace, clarity, and love within. Trust that all is well in the world and that with patience, passion, and persistence, you will manifest all of your desires. Mm. So that is so beautiful and definitely accurate. Uh, there's one more meaning to the word, uh, to 43, which is love you. The four is the four letters of love. The three is the three letters of you. Love you. Oh, that's 
neat. Yeah. And how about 33, Julie, for you? 33 is just a number that I've always felt connected to. Really threes. And then I realized that nine when I was in elementary school, oh, a nine is just three threes put together. So that became my favorite number too. Um, But I don't see a lot of that. It's not really a sign. It's just a personal thing. I see um, in the beginning, I saw 11s everywhere. Uh, Then it switched to 44. And then it switched to 43. But everything, when I would, when it would switch, I would go over to Angel Scribes, uh, Joanne Sacred Scribes, and look up the meaning, and it was always spot on. Oh, I, I love that site. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very neat. I know. Oh, Lauren, I could talk to you all day. I know. You're so wonderful to be around. And for anybody listening, a session with Julie is magical. It is tranquil and serene and one of the loveliest experiences I have had. It's really beyond transforming. Oh, thank you so much. You're so sweet. Thank you. Well, I just love you so much. And thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us and and spending some time with us today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It has been an honor, an absolute honor, and you know I always love to talk to you. Oh, you too. Well, I thank everybody for listening to the podcast today, and please open up your hearts to all of the unexpected blessings that your loved ones, your angels are trying to bring through to you. Uh, The other side is saying to let you know that When you're listening to this podcast and somebody's telling a story or you hear a nugget of information and you're like, oh, that's me too. That is your people trying to show you from your library of experiences that you've had in your life that they're working with you too. So when you have that feeling during the podcast, just know that that's your loved ones, that's your angels trying to get through to you um, the truth that you've had that experience as well, that they're working with you on that as well. Thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful week. Thanks, Julie. Love you so much. Oh, you too, Lauren. Love you so much. My dear friends, you don't know what an incredible, huge, huge, huge blessing it is to this podcast when you write a glowing, positive review for us. It truly helps us get the best experts on the show. I know this might sound a little complex, but if you send me an email after you post a glowing, positive review here, I will put your name into a monthly drawing to win a free 30-minute angel message session with me. And it may just be broadcast on this show at a later date. Your name will be kept in the drawing every month until you win. When you email me, don't forget to include your name, contact information, and positive review. I hope you win. Tune in for a new episode next week where I'll share tools and guidance that can help you fall in love with your life and start living it from a place of peace, bliss, and ease. Thank you so much for listening to the Angels and Awakening podcast. Until next time, know in your heart just how deeply you're loved on the other side and open up your heart to all of the random, unexpected blessings that your angels and your spirit team are trying to bring into your life right now. Disclaimer, this podcast provides general information and discussion about energy healing, spiritual topics, and related subjects. The conversations and other content provided in this podcast and in any linked materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical, psychological, and or professional advice. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately licensed physician or other healthcare professional. Never make any medical or health-related decision based in whole or even in part on anything contained in the Angels and Awakening podcast 
or in any of our linked materials. You should not rely on any information contained in this podcast and related materials in making medical, health-related, or other decisions. You should consult a licensed physician or appropriately credentialed healthcare worker in your community in all matters relating to your health. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Again, angel messages, energy healing, and the information you receive here does not constitute legal, psychological, medical, business, relationship, or financial advice. Do not take any of the advice given in any Angels and Awakening podcasts or sessions in lieu of medical, psychological, legal, financial, or general professional advice. Please note, Angels and Awakening is a podcast produced by Chicago Energy Healing, a company with locations in Wheaton and Naperville, Illinois.